that is one of, one of the many problems of the human rights issue in Iran. Uh, just to give an example, in the last Iranian mount that goes from uh, April 21 to May, uh, to May 20, there were executed in Iran officially 58 people. Other sources tell that um, in these 30 days, more than 10 people, we must add 10 people minimum to these figures. That means 68 in one month. That means more than two executions per day. The execution is, uh, Iran is situated <coughs> in the world listing of the countries where the executions take place at the second place after China. But if uh, we put in relation the number of executions in Iran with the population of Iran, Iran is placed at the first place. Uh, that would be a uh, subject of our panel today. Uh, and we will start, before our distinguished guests uh, take floor, we will start with the testimony of somebody that recently has lived in Iran, Mr. Mohammad Ali Shirzadi. He's a journalist, a uh, film director, and he will speak uh, on behalf of Mr. Emadidine Bavi, Emadidine Bavi also is a writer and a journalist. Uh, he is a founder of an association for the right of uh, an NGO, right of prisoners in Iran. He has been arrested and put in prison several times. One of them because he wrote an article against the death penalty. Uh, he. Uh, Last time that he was in prison, he was because he made an interview with, with the past uh, Grand Ayatollah uh, Montazeri. The interview was aired on BBC in Farsi language. They were speaking about the executions in this interview in the year 80 uh, in Iran. Were in uh, more in less than in five less than a week in five days, several uh, thousand people were executed in. Tehran mostly, and also in some other uh, cities. I asked Mr. Shirzadi, I didn't see him anymore, yeah, please come here and re he will read, uh, he will make a very, uh, very introduction, and after he will read a message from Mr. Bobby. I need a microphone for him, please. Un microfono para... Uh, Mr. Shizal, you speak Persian, so you need the translation if you don't understand Farsi language. خانم ها و آقایان بسیار مفتخر و خوشحالم که در جمع شما خانواده فعالان حقوق بشری هستم من در این فرصتی که به من داده شده پیام یکی از اعضای این خانواده را براحت میکنم کسی که تلاش زیادی در راستای حسب حکم ادام در ایران داشته است اما امروز و در این جلسه به, دلیل به دلائل مشخصی که همه شما میدانید آقای اماد دین باقی امکان حضور پیدا نکرده است قبل از خواندن این مد در این مجال میخواهم از تلاش تمام زنان و مردانی که در ایران در راستای اطلاع کرامت انسانی و بر پایی قوانین بر محتنی بر حقوق بشر تلاش میکنند تشکر کنم خانوم ها و آقایان با سلام به پیشگاه حضار ارجمند و ابراز تأصف از اینکه برای چندمین سال متوالی سعادت حضور در جمع دوست داشتنی شما از من سلب شده است من خود را یک عضو کوچک و محروم شده از شرکت در جمع همفکرانم میدانم و کوچکتر از کوچکتر از آنکه پیامی به آنها بدهم اما به درخواست همکاران برگزار کننده کنگره به جای سخن در حضور 
سخن در دیاب میگوید تابلوهای اهدایی به کنگره محتوای شک پیام دارد هیچ امر مقدسی در جهان بالاتر از جان انسان نیست این سخن بیانگر ارزش والای کاری است که کنگره و شرکت کنندگان آن انجام میدهد بزرگترین نبرد روی زمین نبرد مدافعان و سالبان حیات است و کنگره جهانی علیه مجازات ادام در خط مقدمه آن قرار دارد تشکیل اطلاف جهانی علیه مجازات ادام در سال 2002 با همت فرنچ انجیو تگیدر اگینست دیس پرارتی بزری را در زمین کاش که نهالی از آن برآمد و می رود به درخت تناوری تبدیل شود که سایش را چون بالهای فرشته حیات بر سراسر زمین سایه بگستراند و مشعل گرمی بخش حیات را پیروزمندانه در دست بگیرد هر جا ادام وجود دارد معنایش این است که آنجا کرامت انسان وجود ندارد یا مفهوم کرامت به درستی درک نشده است زیرا انسان موضوع و قایت هستی است همه چیز برای او خلق شده و نه انسان برای آنها و این در تمامی کتب آسمانی آمده است من وقتی به مسائل و مشکلات جامعه سوء مدیریت توسل به زور پرخاشگری جنگ ها اختلاف خانواده ها و بسیاری از مسائل دیگر فرو می روم در نهایت درباره ریشه همه آنها به یک چیز می رسن. و آن هم فقدان باور به کرامت انسان است یعنی اگر برای مردم کرامت انسان درک می شد و معنای آنجا می افتاد و حرمت همدیگر را نگه می داشتن بسیاری از مسائل حل می شد این همان اکسیر حیات و دوای همه درد هاست که گمشده بشر بوده است و همین رو مسئله من فراتر از اعدام یعنی کرامت انسان است و سل و حیات مظهر اعلای نقض کرامت انسان است و همین دلیل مسئله من وسیع تر از اعدام است یعنی مسئله من کشتن انسان است ما با اعدام مخالفت می کنیم در حالی که صدها برابر آن در جنگ ها و بمبگذاری ها به طرز وحشیانی کشته می شود بر اساس اصل واقع بینی و اصلاح تدریجی که در اسناد حقوق بشری مندرجه است ما آرمان نهایی لغو اعدام را یکجا و همین الان برای کشور خود درخواست نمی کنیم بلکه اکنون فقط خواستار حضب مجازات اعدام برای کودکان مواد مخدر، جاسوسی، جرائم مالی، سنگسار و وضع مجازات های جایگزین هستیم در سال گذشته 2012 در ایران طبق خبرهای رسمی منتشر شده در رسانه های داخلی و دولتی حدود 300 نفر اعدام شدند البته آمارهای غیر رسمی بیشتر است که من بنا ندارم با آنها اعتماد کنم همین آمارهای رسمی به اندازه کافی تکان دهنده است یک سوم جرائم محکومان مربوط به مواد مخدر و بقیه به ترتیب مربوط به جرائم سرقت مسلحانه و زورگیری و قتل و محاربه و جن جرائم جنسی مانند تجاوز به عنف بوده است زمینه اغلب این جرائم را فقر و مشکلات اقتصادی تشکیل می‌دهد که مسئولیت آن متوجه سوی مدیریت است تأصف آورترین چیز این است که جامعه واکنشی در برابر این همه ادام نشان نمی‌دهد و با توجه به اینکه نیمی از ادامها در ملعه عام انجام شده است استقبال فراوان مردم تجاب برانگیز شده است انگار به تماشای یک سیرک و نمایش جذاب می روند. وجود همین زمینه ها از دلایل ادام از دلایل ادامه ادام های گسترده است و اگر اینطور نبود حکومت هم نمی توانست گشاد دستانه ادام کند و این نشان دهنده وسعت نیاز ما به کار فرهنگی و اجتماعی است در راستای کار بزرگی که شما بر عهده دارید دو نکته را متذکر می شود یک تلاش های موجود بسیار نیکو اما ناتمام است شایسته است همراه با فشار و اعتراض کار آموزشی همراه با فشار و اعتراض کار آموزشی کرد و با کتاب و مقالب و کار پژوهشی و فیلم به خصوص برای کشورهای توسعه نیافته و در حال توسعه آگاهی عمومی را هرچه بیشتر ارتقا داد دو در بعضی از کشورها مانند در بعضی از کشورهای جهان مانند آمریکا، ژاپن، مالزی، ایران، چین، عربستان، افغانستان هنوز حکم اعدام اجرا می شود اما در وقتی از آنها آمار اعدام سرسام‌آور و وحشتناک است لذا باید مبارزه با اعدام در دو ساعت تعریف شود 
یکی مبارزه با ادام به طور کلی که شامل آمریکا و ژاپن و مالزی و غیره هم می شود و دیگری این که ادام ها که از حدی که بگذرد دیگر ادام نیست قتل عام است و در سازمان ملل به عنوان جنایت علیه بشریت شناخته شود بخیزیم و گامی فرا پیش دهیم با آرزوی جهانی انسانی پیروز باشید اماد الدین با He played an important role in his country promoting uh, human rights. Now he is the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Iran and uh, visiting professor in two American universities, uh, especially at the City University of New York. I give you the floor. You have more or less 10 minutes or something. Thank you. Thank you very much. I distinguish uh, ladies and gentlemen and friends and colleagues. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here today, and I'd like to do it at the round table, and also at the conference. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers, the ECP and the governments of Norway, Switzerland, France, and Spain for sponsoring and hosting this important conference. I was going to speak a bit about um, my contribution in the Maldives to the, to the to death penalty abolition, abolition um, and also about the international uh, norm evolution with regard to the death penalty, but I thought in the interest of time I will jump straight into the situation in Iran. As the UN appointed task with investigating and reporting on the human rights situation in Iran, I assert that there is no more urgent or moral imperative than addressing the Iranian government's frequent and widespread use of capital punishment, which is in many ways a symptom of the deteriorating human rights situation in the country. My alarm is compounded by widespread reports of its use as a tool for silence and dissent, punishing internationally protected practices and our activities, and by the fact that over 80% of the capital punishment sentences are for crimes that do not meet the most serious crime criterion under international law. Last year, the Iran government officially announced almost 300 executions. However, credible reports from family members, lawyers, and human rights defenders and organizations estimated that 497 executions were implemented in the last year, and of that, 58 were public executions. These figures do not include disturbing accusations that some 500 additional secret executions in the last six months have been have taken place in place of Makilabad prison, which warrant alarm, inquiry, and this is part of the international community. The vast majority of these executions are related to alleged drug possession and trafficking. The Iranian government has argued that these acts are tantamount to the, to the perpetration of violent crimes upon the populace and population of destination countries. The government also regards adultery, blasphemy, alcohol consumption, and some economic crimes as capital offenses. Crimes against national security as defined by the Iran government also carry the death penalty. These crimes also invariably involve the charge of muharraba, which has no direct translation, but implies trespass against God, and or mufsad fil ars, which also translates to corruption on earth. Needless to say, none of these additional executable offenses meet the most serious crime standard set by international law. Article 6 also say of the ICPR all safeguards against the arbitrary deprivation of life and remind states that the death penalty may not be imposed if particular aspects of the covenant are violated. The Human Rights Committee interpreted this to mean that all capital trials must observe that fair trial provisions of the ICCPR, for example, 
for the death penalty may not be um, imposed unless the fair trial stands were strictly adhered to. This includes the right to be promptly informed of one's charges, to the presumption of innocence, the right to legal counsel of one's choosing, and a sufficient time to prepare a legal defense. It also includes the right to a hearing in the presence of an independent and impartial tribunal, as well as the right to an appeal and clemency. Over the past 20 months, I have been able to gather a substantial amount of information from more than 400 interviews submitted by Iranian residents and recent exiles, despite not being allowed to visit the country. Their narratives portray a situation in which Iran continues to execute individuals for offenses not considered to be serious crimes on international law and in the absence of fair trial standards. The vast majority of individuals that have submitted interviews to me reported serious violations of their due process rights. They often reported being held for periods ranging from a few weeks to several years without charge and that they were subject to severe and frequent psychological and physical torture during interrogations for the purposes of extracted confessions. Most individual, individuals also reported being deprived of adequate access to a lawyer of their choosing, often described hasty trials, and their guilt appeared to be assumed by the tribunal. The Iranian government also asserts that the death penalty is mandatory for those crimes it considers capital offense under the Islamic law. However, as said earlier, the position of the OIC on this matter is not monolithic. A number of Islamic states that have abolished the death penalty disagree with that position. Several UN human rights bodies also consider the mandatory imposition of death penalty to be incompatible with the, rest, with the restriction of capital punishment to the most serious crimes. They assert that when death penalty is mandatory, the principle of mitigation is undermined. The principle of mitigation requires judges to be permitted to apply individual sentences that take into account all relevant factors that may render a particular criminal act such as a murder to be accidental or unintentional which would not fall within the category of most serious crime. Furthermore, a number of execution methods have been identified as unacceptable under international law. The Human Rights Committee has determined that the use of the gas chamber constitute a cruel, human, inhuman and degrading treatment and found public execution to be incompatible with human dignity. The international community has also determined stoning to be cruel and it could be cruel and inhuman, particularly as the size of stones is often limited in order to prolong suffering and death. The Iranian government's response to significant international pressure about the use of stoning, especially in case of adultery, has been deeply unsettling. Iranian representatives have described stoning as human, stating that the prolonged nature of stoning allows for men that are buried up to their waist and for women who are buried up to their chests to dig themselves out and therefore escape from their punishment. They have asserted that this possibility renders the punishment humane and therefore stoning should not be considered a cruel penalty. International law also excludes juveniles, the mentally ill, pregnant women and the elderly from being subject to death, or death penalty. Iran leads the world in execution of juvenile offenders. <coughs> the Iranian government has participated in three re reviews by the UN Human Rights Bodies in the last three years. Two of these reviews have resulted in calls to the Iranian government to abolish death penalty for juveniles in law. However, Iranian law continues to allow capital punishment for persons who have reached puberty, defined as nine years for girls and 15 for boys. Today, more than 100 juvenile offenders are reportedly on death row, and it has been reported that, one, that Iran executed at least three children in 2011, one of them in public. Last month, the Guardian Council of Iran approved the contents of a new draft penal code, which some have claimed represents a step forward in mitigating human rights abuses in Iran. However, amendments appear cosmetic and do not fully address concerns raised by, by the UN community. For example, the new penal code bans execution of individuals who committed alleged crimes before aged of majority. However, it continues to define juveniles as boys under 15 and girls and are girls who have reached nine years and stoning is, a, is still retained as a form of penalty in the penal code. The new penal code similarly no longer defines apostasy and blasphemy as capital offenses. 
However, the law, uh, the law now relies on what is called the knowledge of the judge as a permissible means for defining crimes and punishments. So in fact, the court's reticence serves as a loophole which potentially allows the abolition application of capital punishment in case of apostasy and blasphemy. Activities not meeting internationally recognized definition of more serious or even crimes in most cases also remain subject to capital punishment in the new code, including forms of conceptual same-sex activities, reproductive alcohol consumption, adultery, and fornication. Finally, offenses that can be characterized as enmity against God and corruption on earth have actually been expanded in the new penal code. The old penal code technically restricted these crimes to armed activity or insurrection. However, the new penal code expands the scope of activities subject to capital punishment. This includes such things as publishing lies and damaging the economy of the country. In fact, four individuals, including a former businessman, are currently facing execution on economic corruption charges. Another five members of the Arab Hawazi community also face execution for vaguely defined crimes of enmity against God and corruption on earth. I have also found that members of Iran's ethnic and religious minority communities are particularly vulnerable. Extreme poverty and a lack of economic opportunity, characteristic of provinces occupied by Iran's ethnic minorities, such as the Kurdish and the Baluch, make alternative sources of income, such as drug trafficking and smuggling, attractive for them. Iranian law regards smuggling of items outside of narcotics as crimes punishable by several months of retention or a fine equal to the value of the seized commodities. However, in my report to the Human Rights Council last year, I noted allegations about the indiscriminate killing, of, killing and wounding of dozens of porters that smuggle commodities such as tea, tobacco, and fuel across the border in order to earn a living. Members of Iran's Arab, Azeri, Baluch, and Kurdish communities that advocate for the advancement of civil, political, and cultural rights also appear to be frequently persecuted for national security crimes. And even though religious communities as communities often shy away from politics, the orphans are seen by the government through the political and national security lens. Religious, religious converts, Baha'is, Christians, and other religious community man, man, minorities are routinely charged with espionage and acting against national security, for example. They are often accused of conspiring with Islamic Republic's foreign enemies, of collusion against the government by organizing gatherings or house churches. And they are usually tried in revolutionary courts, which are effectively national security courts. International law is clearly moving towards abolition of the death penalty. And international custom is also becoming increasingly abolitionist with more governments regarding the death penalty as being inconsistent with human rights standards. Arguments in favor of retaining death penalty often appear to rely on unproven allegations, such as its deterrent effect, or focus solely on the argument that the decision to abolish or retain capital punishment remains within national sovereignty. Additional arguments relying on religious or cultural grounds appear to be criticized when investigated in depth and have not prevented other nations from abolition. This is reflected by the growing opposition to death penalty by a majority of members in the UN General Assembly. Last year, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution on a moratorium on capital punishment with, a re with record support from 110 of the UN's 193 member states. Vigilance by the international com community and human rights defenders must continue to advance the abolitionist movement globally. We must also continue to support efforts to ensure that, that, that retentionist countries live up to their obligations to restrict law who it is permissible to execute and under what conditions. Iran's use of capital punishment for offenses and activities not deemed to be serious crimes or crimes at all on international law, the execution of protected individuals such as juveniles, and the widespread and often arbitrary nature of the application of death penalty warrant serious international consternation and calls for an immediate moratorium on death penalty in Iran. Moreover, while there is no doubt that drug trafficking and use of Huge, uh, and use are huge social problems for Iran. The fact that so many of Iran's executions are the result of drug offenses should be cause for serious concern to those parties and groups that provide material support to anti-narcotics efforts in the country. All organizations and governments that, that oppose Iran's current use of death penalty should ensure that no funds intended for prevention and treatment are used for arrests, 
that they may ultimately lead to executions. In the absence of such assurances, the correct course of action may be removal of material support altogether, and at such time as relative certainty can be established that funding will not be used to contravene UN and international human rights norms. I remain hopeful that in the coming years, Iran will turn the positive international tide of nations placing moratoria on the, on the death penalty, not only because of the specific, specific issues of Iran um, outlined here, but because of issues inherent to capital punishment that have been described here by myself and, and, and we will soon hear, hopefully here. Such a step would go a long way for Iran in its efforts to build, increase international influence and lead by example. A shift in this direction will require ongoing efforts of society act activists, NGOs, and abolitionist governments like those in this room, who have worked tirelessly to advance the abolitionist cause to a forum like this one. I thank you all for your inspirational efforts in this um, endeavor, and I look forward to celebrating even more progress with you in the months and years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaheed. Dr. Shaheed, as always, he gave a very, uh, more or less, uh, complete picture of what is going on in Iran regarding the human rights abuses. Uh, our next uh, speaker comes uh, from uh, Fars region, uh, uh, city of Shiraz. City of Shiraz has one of the prisons where they have taken place a lot of execution in the last months and even in the first years after the revolution. Uh, so he is a lawyer, uh, he has worked in fast programs, he has uh, given uh, life as founder of Nidai Edalat, the voice of justice, and uh, that was a legal assistance association in Shiraz. He has studied in Shiraz and his master in Tehran in criminal law. Uh, actually, he is located in Canada. You have the floor, Mr. Bays. Thank you very Moderator. I was able to get the first meeting of the Farsi meeting. I was able to get the first meeting of the Farsi meeting. I was able to get the first meeting of the Farsi meeting. اول باید تشکر کنم از برگزار کنندگان و از کسانی که فریادی هستند علیه اعدام در سراسر دنیا و بعدا من میخوام بخشی از تجربم رو در بیستالی که بکالت کردم در ایران و با افراد بسیار زیادی که یا اعدام شدن یا در معرض مجازات اعدام بودن برخورد کردم را با تکیه بر داده های علمی حقوقی و استاندارد های بین المللی با شما در میان بذارم. مهمترین مشکلی که در حال حاضر در ایران وجود داره من در چند بخش میبینم یک بخش محتوایی و یک بخش شکلی. در بخش محتوایی باید بگم که ما با قانون گذاری ضعیف و نادرستی مواجه هستیم این اولین پوینت هست و دومین پوینت این که خانونگذاری که در ایران اتفاق میفته از یک طرف و نحوه رفتاری که به وسیله قوه قضاییه اتفاق میفته از طرف دیگه دادرسی عادلانه را در ایران جاری نمیکنه و همچنین تضمین نمیکنه این پوینت دوم و پوینت سوم و مهمترین پوینت این که ما با تفاسیر نادرست سیاسی و بعضا مذهبی از مقرراتی که بر ایران در حال حاضر حاکمه مواجه هستیم و بر پروسه قانونگذاری در ایران مواجه هستیم این سه پوینتی بود که از نظر من بسیار اهمیت داره که هر این سه مورد را در ادامه با هم بررسی کنیم مجازات اعدام در ایران بسیار بحث برانگیز تر از سایر جاها هست به دلیل ماهیت و ساختار حقوقی مذهبی که در ایران شکل گرفته در حقیقت مجازات اعدام 
در ایران و در کشورهایی که اون را اجرا می کنن یک کلید محض در اختیار سیاست برای اینکه پی ببریم که چگونه این کلید محض هست در ادامه می بینیم که قوه قضایی در ایران در ظاهر بعد از انقلاب پنج و هفت ساختمان و ساختار مستقل پیدا کرده یعنی وزیر دادگستری ایران رئیس قوه قضایی نیست پس ساختارش مستقل بود ولی در واقع و در عمل به هیچ وجه مستقل نیست از ساختار حاکمیت مستقل نیست و از حقوق شهروندان به شکل صحیح و درستش حمایت نمی کنه. چرا؟ برای اینکه تمامی ساختاری که در قوه مجریه قوه قانونگذاری و قوه قضایی ایران وجود داره به یک جا ختم میشه و اون رهبری ایران و بخشی از ایدت های مذهبی که بر روند های و فرصه قانونگذاری در ایران بسیار نظارت دقیق و اشراف دارد همین اتفاق ها که گفتم و به خصوص نقش مذهب از دیدگاه من به عنوان یه وکیل مانع جدی برای توسعه حقوق در ایران شده حقوق در ایران نیاز به توسعه داره ما حتی در مذهبی های ایران هم توی 500 سال اخیر کسی نداریم که در حوزه حقوق کیفری تونسته باشه کوچکترین قدم موثر در تفسیرهای دقیق از مسائل کیفری داشته باشه در ادامه به این هم اشاره می تجربه من با عنوان کسی که درگیر بوده با همین موضوعاتی که گفتم به سادگی میتونم براتون ثابت کنم که مسائل سیاسی بسیار تأثیر گذار هست بر میزان و افزایش مجازات اعدام نه تنها به عصر مجازات اعدام بلکه بر میزان افزایشش و اجرای علنی اون در پابلیک خیلی خیلی ساده بعد از انتخابات 2008 که الان تکرارش رو فردا داریم 2009 سال 88 ما با خیلی مجازات های در علنی مواجه هستیم از جمله کسانی که بعد از این ها اعدام شدن پنج نفر بودن که یکیشون آقای کمانگر بود یکی از اون پنج نفر یکی از کسانی بود که من از نزدیک کیس شد اون بالم کردم به نام مهدی اسلامیان مهدی اسلامیان اتهامش اینه که به برادرش که, بم... که نقش داشته گفته شده نقش داشته در بمبگذاری سال 2008 در ایران کمک کرده من این شخص را در زندان دیدم و کیسش را بررسی کردم اگرچه نهایتا کار کار دیگه هم انجام داد اما اون چیزی که من بررسی کردم و از ایشون شنیدم ایشون تا روز بمبگذاری اصلا خبر از بمبگذاری نداشت و بعدش صرفا به برادرش کمک میکنه تا بتونه بعد که از کشور خارج بشه و 200 هزار تومن هم پول به اون براش حواله دید من به قاضی گفتم که این فقط مجازاتش کمک در فراری دادن یک متهم است که حد اکثر مجازاتی که در قانون ایران براش پیشگیری شده دو سال هست قاضی سلاواتی به من خندی گفت نه تا همیش محاربه است و جالب اینجاست که به شما بگم بمبگذارانی که در شیراز اعدام شدن قبل از انتخابات 88 اعدام شدن قبل از انتخابات 2009 اعدام شدن اما مهدی اسلامیان اعدام نشد مهدی اسلامیان بعد از انتخابات 2009 همراه با کسانی که بعد از 
درگیری ها و اعتراضات مردمی دستگیر شده بودن اعلام شد به سادگی کیس این که من از نزدیک مواجه بودم باهاش نشون میده که اعدام ها به خصوص افزایش اعدام ها ارتباط به موضوعات سیاسی داره و نکته بعدی ب... مسئله مسئله تفسیر نسبت به مقررات است ما در جا... دو جای مهم داریم که بیشترین تعداد اعدام ها اتفاق می یکی در مواد مخدر و دیگری در قط و موضوع بعدیش به ترتیب اگر بگیم در مورد اقام علیه حکومت یا محاربه است در مورد مسئله مواد مخدر در ایران ما با یک قانونی مواجه هستیم که اولین قانون در سال 1367 تصویب شده به وسیله مجموعه تشخیص و دومین قانون در همین رابطه اصلاح شده در سال 76 به وسیله همین مجموعه تشخیص یعنی قانون گذاری در این رابطه اساسا دموکراتیک نیست و ضمن این که ساختار خود این قانون هم نادرسته تجدید نظرخواهی در ارتباط با پرونده های مواد مخدر اساسا وجود نداره فقط پرونده فقط نسبت به پرونده های اعدام پرونده برای یک بررسی کوتاه به نزد دادستانی کل ارسال میشه و دادستانی کل میدونیم که یک مرجع بیطرف و مرجع مستقل نیست چون اون دادستان کله نمیتونه بیطرف باشه و حق نداره مرحله تجدید نظرخواهی از پرونده های مواد مخدر رو اون انجام بده و مهمترین نکته دیگه در اتباط با وصف قتله که آمار بالایی ما داریم تفسیری که از قتل میشه و قانونگذاری که در مورد قتل عمدی درجه اول میشه در فرقی بین قتل هایی که به صورت ناگهانی اتفاق میفته و قتل هایی که با برنامه ریزی اتفاق میفته اساسا قابل نیست قانون ایران این بسیار بسیار خطرناکه در حالی که 89 درصد قتل هایی که در ایران اتفاق میفته غیر برنامه ریزی شده هست یعنی ناگهانی اتفاق میفته تصمیم ناگهانی است و تعداد اندکی از قتل هایی که در ایران اتفاق میفته قتل های برنامه ریزی شده است پس نتیجه میگیریم که در این مسائل هم از نظر شکلی و هم از نظر محتوایی ما دوچار مشکل هستیم که اگر فرصت بیشتری در ادامه داشتم من بخش های دیگه و نمونه هایی از پرونده ها برای شما بیان خواهم متشکرم just want to say that uh, Abdul Rahman Kumar, father of uh, Roya uh, and Ladan, the other sister, co-founder, that he's sitting here, he was, uh, he was assassinated in Paris. Uh, he was close, very close of uh, Mr. Bakhtiar, the last Iranian uh, prime minister uh, before the revolution. He was assassinated uh, because of his acts uh, for democracy in Iran, that uh, this foundation is a demonstration that you can kill the people, but you cannot stop the, their ideas. Their ideas that continue even when uh, they are killed. Uh, Roya Bruma, she is a human rights activist, human rights activist. She has worked for Human Rights Watch, Human Rights Watch, and has published several articles and studies on human rights in Iran and in uh, North Africa. You have it.
hear us? So, um, <coughs> Mr. Alpat um, explained a little bit the concept behind our work, uh, but uh, so very quickly, One, two, three, four. <laughs> discriminating. Yes, this mic is discriminating. So we can't even rely on mics when Iranians are. <laughs> um, so this um, this project, we you heard a lot of um, a lot of um, uh, data about what is going wrong in Iran. And our work is um, a little bit more global, looking at now and looking at the future. Uh, our organization, uh, the Abraham and Gorman Foundation, is a nonprofit Washington, D.C. based organization founded um, in April 2001. Um, we believe that the promoting human rights awareness through education and the dissemination of information is a necessary prerequisite for the establishment of a stable democracy in Iran. ABF's keystone project, and one of the most relevant to, for efforts to abolish the death penalty, is a searchable online electronic memorial called OMI, containing thousands of cases of executions and assassinations committed by the Iranian government or its agents. This bilingual memorial is a first step in a longer process of truth, justice, and reconciliation for Iranians. An extensive library, including international human rights instruments and reports in Farsi and English, grounds the omit individual stories within the international human rights context. The project started with two volunteers in a home office and is now in its 11th year of existence and has become a credible historical record a common project to which Iranians of all walks of life contribute beyond political and other divides. The concept of the memorial takes roots in the Iranian revolution of 1979 and the failed transition to a human rights-based polity. Iranians had limited exposure to human rights concepts and the radical revolutionary leadership had no interest in justice. The revolutionary tribunals set up hastily in February 1979 without written procedures lacked fairness and independence. Instead of reaffirming the relevance of the norms that alleged perpetrators had violated, the courts denied defendants basic rights, such as that of defense, attorneys, or an appeal. This history remains relevant to the understanding of Iran's judicial practices and to any advocacy strategy. Transition from the current authoritarian state in Iran will be a reality sooner or later. Both the memorial and the human rights library, which contains my, multiple translated texts regarding the capital punishment, can bring to light the arbitrary and ineffective nature of the death penalty and engage the public in a reflection and debate on the death penalty and justice. The judiciary's failure to restore citizens' trust in the judicial process affects human rights advocacy inside Iran. Most importantly, the revolutionary courts have normalized due process violations and continue to issue death sentences routinely thanks to the vast and vague jurisdiction that allows them to try almost any case. The death toll of the revolutionary and ordinary courts is unknown. Tens of thousands of individuals have been executed and hundreds continue to be killed yearly. Uh, you heard Dr. Shani talk about the charges and of course, you have um, people have been killed and continue to be killed for apostasy, um, addiction, possession of limited amounts of drugs, etc. The number of crimes punishable by death in Iran is astonishingly high. At least 87, compared to the highest um, highest number in another country, which is Pakistan, which is 40. Um, so far, Omid has close to 20,000 entries. The database Omid has close to 20,000 entries. But thousands of cases of executions are waiting to be processed. Between 2002 and 2012, we have reports of at least 4,092 executions. This number is, of course, not exhaustive, but indicates a concerning trend that requires international attention. However, 
addressing past and ongoing abuses, and stopping executions requires proper documentation and advocacy inside the country. The Islamic Republic's leadership has been, for the most part, effective in preventing both. In the absence of justice and public recognition, the hundreds of thousands of Iranians who have lost loved ones or suffered from torture, imprisonment, and other human rights violations are unable to heal or have closure. These victims can be a force to promote a rights-based system of government in the future, transition, or be a potential source of violence. I have two minutes, so um, perhaps I'm going to summarize uh, some of uh, some of what we do. And um, in, but I would, I'm giving you numbers, but in our experience, numbers are not as effective as details. Uh, details of a case um, are much more uh, moving, and not only the biographies attract attention, but every single case of a person executed while denied the right to due process of law helps open a deba debate about due process of law. And when you have that for hundreds or thousands of cases, then you start a discussion on impartial justice, on fair prosecutions, and of course on capital punishment. And this is what we hope to do through uh, the victims. Uh, the victims as a vehicle, because they are interested in getting talking, they are interested in seeing their loved ones um, uh, remembered, and they are the connection to the larger society. So how we do this, um, we rely on official and semi-official newspapers, documents, cemetery records, interviews of victims, witnesses, relatives, published testimonies, etc. But um, in our database, we don't, ha we don't prioritize victims. We don't have um, good or bad victims. Everyone is in the database with the same rights and the same, um, uh, the same visibility. In our view, if you want to uh, advocate successfully and campaign targeting the death penalty, you, require, you have to convince citizens of the equal rights and worth of human beings. Um, and the arbitrary and unfair application of the death penalty is a component of such campaign. So we try to avoid distinguishing victims based <coughs> on their alleged deeds and remind the public that the right to life and due process are relevant in every case. And this is more important than it appears in countries where human, human beings have not the same worth and the same rights. Um, we have a methodology, obviously, that we can talk about if you have questions. Thank you. Thank oh, you. well, maybe. One, one more thing. Um, we can't really evaluate the impact of our work at the national level. Uh, however, the public has responded very positively. This database was made public in 2006, and we have close to 3,000 electronic um, communications from people who have given us information or um, has have completed, corrected the cases we have online. Um, whether or not this effort will have a significant impact during a future transition remains to be seen. In the meantime, our victim-focused documentation impacts positively the lives of thousands, and it's enough motivation for us to continue and also to have hope that our work will inspire <coughs> other groups in other countries. Thank you very much. Mahmoud Amir Mohadam, he is a neuroscientist. He is founder and spokesperson for Iran Human Rights. In 2007, he received for his human rights activities uh, the, the, uh, I mean the Nobel, I mean, I mean, I mean, Amnesty International Nobel Human Rights Prize. And uh, he is teaching at the university, also as the head of the laboratory of Molecular neuroscience at the university. I hope he will speak to uh, about the human rights and not about morphology. <laughs> 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 I mean, they understand anything. But I, I want to, uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Shahid mentioned the Bakilawan treason in Mashhad and a lot of executions that they take part there and they never, there's no record of that in the official documents of Iran. 
And uh, you know, my life was one of the first uh, videos you speak about this uh, execution most the Afghan citizens that they have been executed. Not the floor. That's a fine. Um, thank you very much, and uh, thanks the organizers uh, for inviting us here and for all of you to listen uh, to us. Uh, I think uh, the other uh, speakers, uh, they have uh, given a very um, comprehensive picture of uh, the death penalty in Iran and the situation of the human rights. I was asked to talk about gathering reliable information on the death penalty in Iran and uh, working with the international community, but I would like to say how it is to be uh, an NGO, Iranian NGO, working from outside. Because in countries with the massive use of capital uh, punishment, death penalty, with lack of transparency in the judicial system, uh, NGO, human rights NGOs, uh, they are banned from the international organizations, they cannot enter the country. The media is controlled by the authorities and information about the death penalty is classified so that not all cases of the death penalty are announced by the authorities. Uh, in these countries, it's normally large organizations such as uh, Amnesty International, uh, Human Rights Watch, uh, which are the main sources of information for the international community. However, these organizations, uh, they have also their own limitations because they operate from outside. They depend on sources within the country which are not always available. And uh, since they cover the whole world, they don't have um, enough resources to put on one single country. So very often the information published by the large organizations, they are based on the information announced by the official sources. They still do a very good and very important job, but my point is that um, local or native NGOs are necessary in order to give a more complete picture of the death penalty. Because of their access to sources, their accurate knowledge about the local situation, culture, language, and they are focused in that country. So Iran in, is one of these countries, as you know, no NGOs uh, are allowed, independent NGOs, to work there. International organizations and the special reporters, they are not allowed to enter the country. So the Iranian NGOs working on, Iran, on human rights and death penalty operate mainly from outside the country, like our NGOs. One of the main challenges of being an NGO working from outside is to gain credibility. Because uh, the Iranian authorities, they blame us for um, spreading lies and false propaganda. And traditionally, the reports about the human rights situation have been uh, published by groups who are also affiliated with political opposition. So that the authorities, they say that these are not politically independent, so you can't trust them. Although uh, I'm not saying that uh, the, the reports by political organization are right or wrong. So I think that close cooperation with uh, big organizations, human rights organizations, are necessary. I believe the World Coalition, which Iran Human Rights is a member of, and also uh, Burman Foundation uh, is a member now, uh, it's a good model where small and large organizations, they work together, uh, and the larger and more experienced ones, they, uh, they can help the smaller ones with their experience. And another challenge that I didn't mention uh, about small organizations, of course, they don't have funding and they don't have experience. So, Iran Human Rights started its activities around year 2005 uh, as a small, politically independent network of human rights activists, mainly in Iran, and uh, one of them was in Norway, uh, that's me. At that time, the main focus was uh, juveniles on the death row, 
Our main objective was to create awareness and organize campaigns around individual cases. One such case was uh, Leila Mafi. I don't know if you have uh, remember her case. Uh, an 18 year old uh, girl who was sentenced to death for extramarital sexual relations. Leila was uh, sold by, uh, by, by her parents as a prostitute at the age of nine. She, was, uh, she got pregnant several times, each time they took away her kids, and she was lashed 100 times for immoral relationship. And uh, she was sexually abused by her brothers. That's the reason she was sentenced to death, for having sexual relationship with the family members. Despite the fact that she had said that she was abused, so what we started the campaign uh, around Leila, it uh, received a huge attention in Norway. I think there were similar campaigns in other countries as well. In Norway, not only human rights organizations such as Amnesty, uh, but also politicians at all, all levels, and also uh, ordinary people got involved in Leila's case. The Norwegian prime minister, wrote a personal letter to the president, Hatami at that time, and this attention made the Iranian judiciary to consider Leila's case. And thanks to the lawyers and human rights defenders inside Iran and the campaigns outside, uh, her death sentence was removed. This is from a, a, an Iranian news agency saying that the judge was wrong. Leila is not going to be executed. And uh, Leila was released after being, uh, after they changed the death sentence to 99 lashes. So she was lashed 99 times before she was released. And uh, again, thanks to donors, she was, uh, uh, it was possible uh, for her to go to a private institution and not going back to the same abusive family. So her uh, story is a good example of uh, how activists outside Iran and inside Iran can cooperate, uh, getting international attention, but it's based on accurate information from inside. And we should also keep in mind that those inside the country, it's very risky for them if they are affiliated to groups outside, so it has to be kept secret that we were collaborating. But uh, since then, they have had several, uh, several uh, campaigns with different outcomes. Since uh, 2007, Iran Human Rights uh, has focused all its attention on uh, the death penalty. Uh, our website, uh, it doesn't seem very complicated, but uh, it's only comp uh, focused on death penalty. At that time, it was uh, pretty new in the Iranian context, and also the fact that we, as uh, uh, Roya uh, also mentioned, we focus on all cases of the death penalty, not only on the political uh, executions and the juveniles, as was the case before. So one of our main uh, aims is to promote cultural abolition without, within the Iranian society and create awareness in the international uh, community. So. I was uh, going to just uh, give a, uh, have a look at uh, our annual report very shortly uh, to see, to just make some examples. As you see, this is the trend. These are the numbers of executions that we have published. From uh, 2005 to 2008, the numbers belong to Amnesty International and after that, belong to Iran Human Rights. If you look at all the numbers published about here, Iran and uh, executions in Iran, they are different if you look at different organizations, but they show the same trend. The reason why they are different is because, as I say, access to unofficial executions is very difficult. So what we see is a general increasing tendency of executions. The numbers in red, they show the reported executions that we haven't managed to confirm. So, uh, when it comes to, let's say, uh, the annual reports in 2012, we have 580 confirmed executions. 
51% of them are based on the official Iranian sources and 49 on unofficial sources that they have managed to confirm. In order to confirm an official execution, uh, we need either two, uh, the same report from two independent sources or direct eyewitness, uh, family member, uh, uh, lawyers, and, uh, and uh, normally a combination of these. So it's a very difficult job. And as I said, we believe that when we, with the, the limited resources, manage to uh, confirm about 280 executions, um, probably the real number is much higher. So this is a, a, a diagram showing uh, this execution geographic distribution. The yellow shows the secret executions. Um, you know, some of the cities, like uh, in West Azerbaijan, in Urmia, of all the executions that they have confirmed, they were uh, carried out secretly. They have managed to, uh, to confirm secret executions in 15 different prisons. And uh, one of the prisons is in, uh, uh, well, the prisons around Tehran, 114 executions secretly. And then Bakilabad, uh, last year we managed to confirm 95, uh, well, 85 secret executions in Bakilabad, in Mashhad, that uh, Dr. Shahid also mentioned. And since then, several hundred. What we heard through our sources, as I say, two independent sources, that there have been executed, uh, secret executions every Wednesday and every Sunday, at least 10 people. Most of them are uh, um, charged with uh, drug-related uh, charges. And uh, very often, uh, the families, they are not aware of the executions. Their bodies are not given to the families. And many of them are uh, Afghan citizens. I will be done very shortly. Since uh, the situation in Iran is uh, actually very difficult, uh, human rights reporters, they can be sentenced, uh, they can be charged <coughs> for espionage, and in the worst case, actually be sentenced to death. But we have managed to confirm some of the res these uh, so, uh, re reports through our sources in Afghanistan. And this is a recent report by Al Jazeera from Afghanistan uh, confirming execution of Afghan citizens in the Bakilabad prison. The bodies very often haven't been given to the uh, families and, uh, and uh, the executions have been carried out secretly. So I think uh, I will not, uh, uh, I, I will just invite you for a poster. Uh, my students have prepared a poster. Um, uh, she's uh, stuck in Amsterdam, but she will come tomorrow. So they will be posted tomorrow. And uh, the question is, you know, about 76% of those executed in Iran uh, are charged for drug-related uh, charges. But as Dr. Shaikh mentioned, we believe that Iranian authorities use that penalty as a political instrument to spread fear in the society. So what we have done is to look at the trends of the execution in the last 10 years and look at the relation between the executions and the main political events in the country. Uh, it's very difficult to see it here, but uh, for instance, if we zoom on the uh, period 2007 and 2009, we see that in the periods when authorities expect protests, like anniversary of the student uh, uprising, normally there is a top in the executions. It's in July. In the period where the international community is watching Iran, like around the election time, like here in the parliamentary election, and this is the presidential election, we have a very low number of executions. But before, before <coughs> and after, the numbers are very high. So visit this, and you know, this study is not finished, but I think, uh, uh, as I said, we believe that executions are politically motivated, even though they are uh, for drug trafficking.
Uh, I will give uh, 30 minutes to people to make questions or remarks. But before it, uh, I will make questions to all participants and I, uh, I hope they will answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have seen that uh, the human right, uh, the execution, increasing execution every year more than the other the absolute figures. Uh, Dr. Mardam explained that uh, uh, between uh, when. Did you hear me? Okay. Uh, okay, we have seen figures that the uh, executions in Iran every year are more than the year before, and especially the non announced, non confirmed executions are more extrajudicial executions are always more. Uh, the Iranian government used execution as executions as we see to uh, when, the, when the, uh, they think that the people would be on the street for the protest just to uh, say them stay at home, if not you will be executed also. And it worked somehow. So I have a question for all participants. What uh, we can do in Iranian abroad, the international community, to say to stop execution in Iran, which is too much, but to reduce it, to, I mean, to press the government uh, somehow that they will make this use of execution, political use of execution, from there. There is a lot um, that could be done, um, and of course, you know, denying access to uh, to the media makes it very difficult. But the Iranian media report a lot, and I think one thing, as I said, are the details because um, you know the, the government can dismiss uh, ex uh, the criticism by saying this is our culture, we don't understand, this is what um, uh, it's different here, right? And I'm sure Dr. Shen heard a lot of this. We all do. But for example, when Hujat um, al-Islam Muhammad Ali Fazel in May 2007 says, in one case, the entire process, the investigation, the issuance of the verdict, and implementation of the verdict took only 20 hours. This case demonstrates that cases about which the public is sensitive can be dealt with promptly, and the judgment can be implemented without delay. You know, these, these things have to be given visibility. When in the case of Sakina Ashtiani, the sentence got out, and um, she, two of the five judges had refused to, um, to convict her for adultery, saying that there was no, uh, no evidence, then, you know, focusing on that does affect the situation inside Iran, because no culture, no religion condones killing innocents. And so I think that's their weakness. The weakness is the process. And so visibility has to be given to that. And that, that does make a difference. Thank you. I will add that she mentioned that 24 hours of process at the beginning of the revolution, myself as a journalist with other four colleagues, we went with uh, Mr. Khalkhali, that was a judge, to Kurdistan. And the process and uh, executions takes together five minutes. So if now it's 24 hours, they have never problems. Uh, at the beginning of revolution, it was five minutes. In one week, they have killed more than 2,500 people, starting from the judgment to execution, each maximum five minutes. Uh, Mr. Moabba. Uh, yes, so uh, what can we do? Uh, I think it's very important. Uh, uh, when you leave this place, you should remember that international pressure it helps it's very important because uh, people say well iranian authorities they continue executing anyway and uh, if you look at the numbers they are actually increasing so what does it help to do or to protest um, i say that international attention helps mainly in individual cases we, we have seen several examples. I mentioned Leila, you know, Sakin Ashtiani, that you know, uh, there was an international campaign to stop her stoning. Yeah, uh, uh, and, and there are many other examples of juveniles uh, who were on the death row who are not executed. Iranian authorities have been forced 
to change the law with regards to juvenile, so that now it is written that uh, uh, execution for drug trafficking, you know, when it comes to juvenile, is not going to take place. So this is because of the uh, international pressure. And uh, we should also remember, since the call of the executions is not to fight the crime, but it is to survive, uh, the cost is very important. How much they pay for these executions. So increasing the cost of these executions by international attention is important. And if you see in this diagram, uh, you know, around the elections, when the world is watching Iran, we don't see public executions or executions in the, those two weeks. But before and after, you see that. So what I hope is that the attention Iran is receiving around the election day uh, should be the same throughout the year. We need sustainable attention on the death penalty and sustainable pressure on Iranian authorities. Thank you, Mr. Moradam, uh, mentioning the, the international pressure my personal experience, we started at that time in Italy because Italy was, I was based in Italy, and Italy was the, had the presidency of the European Union. When two young journalists in Marivan were condemned to uh, death, uh, death sentence, we have started a campaign involving the, all European countries uh, with help of uh, Mr. Prodi, who was Iran, Italian Prime Minister. And in four weeks, they have reduced it to 15 years. And one of them is now out second is still in prison, but it works. The international pressure on Iran, it works. And second, Ashton is others, and many other things. Okay, to you, Rafael, Mr. Shahid, the last one, as the representative of international community. Uh, من فقط میخوام بگم که از بنیاد گرومند، از Human Rights Iran آقای دکتر مقدم، از مرکز اسناد و بشر ایران این اینجوری که خیلی خوب کار میکنن، باید تشکر کنم که به خصوص روی اعدام های Undercover کار میکنن و گزارش هاشو بسیار عادی هست اما میخوام بگم که ما نباید فقط بر روی اعدام ها کار کنیم ما برای رفع اعدام، برای من اعدام باید کار کنیم. قانون اعدام باید و ظرفیت داره که از مقررات ایران هست بشه. چرا جامعه جهانی بعد از 34 سال از دولت ایران سوال نمیکنه دادگاه های انقلابت را تعطیل کن؟ چرا نمیخواد ازش که دادگاه های انقلاب تعطیل بشه؟ دادگاه های انقلاب توی قانونی که اخیرا در مجلس هست قرار رو تعطیل بشه. ولی تعطیل نشد. چرا سوال نمیکنه برای مواد مخدر که بسیاری از موارد کسانی که در اثر اعدام کشته می شوند افرادی هستند که خود قربانی هن. افراد فقیری هستند که در استخدام کارتل ها و آدم های پرفعی قاچاق مواد مخدر هستند و اینها اعدام می شن. جامعه جهانی به طور جدی سوال نمی کنه. چرا در مورد سرقت، چرا در مورد جرام مالی، چرا سوال نمی کنه. قانون مجازات اسلامی جدیدی که الان تصویب شده دو روز پیش لازم را اجرا شده در ایران چشمندازی ایجاد خواهد کرد که من پیش بینی می کنم به عنوان یک وکیل که در سالهای آینده با رشد جمعیت کیفری و با رشد مجازات اعدام در جرائم غیر جدی مواجه هستیم نگاه کنید به ماده 286 این قانون به سادگی برای نشر کازیب برای جرائم مالی، برای رفتار مبتنی بر همجنسگرایی و هر رفتار خلاف اخلاقی میتونن مجازات اعدام تعیین کنند به عنوان فساد در زمین با این یک تعریف بسیار نادرست پس جامعه جهانی میتونه و باید بخواد تعهدات دولت ایران در ماده شیش میساق بین المللی حقوق مدنی سیاسی که بهش اشاره کردن دوستان من بر این هست که صرفا در جرائم جدی مجازات اعدام داشته باشه کسانی که برای سرقت من دقیقا کلاینتی داشتم که به مجازات محاربه به خاطر سرقت متهم شده و در دیوان عالی کشور ایران رأی 
اون تأیید شده من تجدید نظر مجدد خواستم نهایتاً به سه سال زندان محکوم شد این فرق بین اعدامی که قرار بود تا هفته پیش شکل بگیره تا بعدش میشه سه سال زندان این یعنی در جرام غیر جدی وقتی که خوب بگیری نشه مجازات اعدام رواج داره پس من اعتقادم اینه که اولا دادگاه انقلاب باید در ایران تعطیل بشه ثانیاً تفسیرهایی که از مقررات میشه و میره به سمت مجازات اعدام باید برچیده بشه یعنی ما باید دچار رفرم بشیم و سال سن ما باید دادرسی عادلانه به خصوص حضور وکیل در تمامی مراحل دادرسی اهم از تحقیقات و در طول پرسه دستگیری پرسه بازجویی و نهایتا صدور حکم و بعد از حکم وکیل باید در همه کیس ها حضور داشته باشه این تعهد دولت ایران هست در همین رابطه و اسناد بین المللی میخواد اما رعایت نمیشه به هیچ عنوان That's uh, very interesting. Professor, you know, Mr. Raisi, now the floor, I mean, the three Iranian speakers, they have asked uh, some, some more pressure from the international community. We didn't have any other representative of the international community. You are the only one that will change, so give them the best. That's a, that's a big burden. Um, I think the speakers have identified uh, the fact that um, spe in specific cases, campaigns are that in the Users uh, uh, do come. As we've seen that time and time again, Iran relents under pressure. This uh, last March, in fact, Dr. Rajani uh, said after the debate in uh, the Human Rights Council to the press, he said that in his own view, uh, Dr. Rajani is the head of the Iranian Supreme Council on Human Rights. He comes to different Iran's record at various UN meetings. Uh, he said in his own view, Iran was killing too many people. It was a big decision for him to make, and he was saying that Iran needs to review its laws regard to uh, the death penalty for the adults and so on. So uh, the point is when you put Iran before the court of world opinion, uh, it does um, find, it does try to um, mitigate the criticism coming to, uh, towards it by deflecting on specific issues, but we need a more structured approach, I think, uh, ones that focus on specific cases where there are very clear violations of people's rights uh, 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 at stake. We also have to engage Iran on its own arguments in defense of um, its, its uh, um, death penalty uh, provisions, including the cultural religious argument, to really scrutinize the argument whether or not Islam or its own version that Iran has does justify uh, the range of death penalty that's, that's been imposed, or any death penalty to be imposed uh, uh, in the name of Islam. Second, like we heard from here, uh, we also need to have that campaign focus on Iran taking steps to, to, to adhere to its own legal framework. The relation of course, are not part of the constitutional makeup of, of Iran, but added on later, later on. So you need to actually expose Iran's own death its own people. I'm surprised by the level of uh, lack of awareness amongst the international community about what's going on in Iran. I mean, that, that does increase, Iran actually does care about it. Unlike some of the other violators, say North Korea, for example, Iran does care very much about what the world thinks of it, and therefore does uh, move in ways to make it look better. Iran also cares what its own people think about its own performance. And that's why it centers so much what's been said about uh, the country. So we need to uh, demonstrate to the people of Iran that their government is a serious breach of civilized norms, and also demonstrate to the world that they have uh, in them a country which is a gross violation of principles that they also adhere to. We can also mobilize um, in a more structured way, say, opinion in terms of reaching out to the global community of, say, women, in terms of how Iran actually, um, Iran laws discriminate against women, including capital punishment. If we can reach out to journalists and in terms of how they, they are, their brethren in Iran actually face death penalty for national security crimes. If we can reach out to, uh, say, interfaith uh, leaders, see how their uh, you know, brethren feel uh, death penalty, face death penalty in Iran. So we need to have a more structured and more sustained uh, day for Iran in the court of world opinion. Thank you. Thank you. You have two remarks. One minute, one and one. One minute each. Um, just um, one, one thing that um, I think is really uh, missing, especially in the media, perhaps in the governance, is that we owe a lot to lawyers who are um, brave, brave enough to pick these cases and provide information to the outside world. This is dangerous. Uh, people get caught, arrested. Uh, Mr. Raisi um, 
has um, experiences that we can talk, but we talked about Sakine, for example. Um, had we not uh, had his lawyer send the sentence out about um, what, how she was, um, she was sentenced, we could not do a lot of what he did. And he was arrested, and he, was, he has been tortured in prison, and his case is extremely sensitive. And because no one does anything, he is really dying in prison. And so I think, you know, Gutan uh, Kion, um, his case is very typical. You know, some lawyers get visibility, but for ordinary cases, lawyers get forgotten. Sakine is alive, and he's dying in prison, and I think that we should not let that happen. Yes, and, and when it comes to the, again international community, uh, you know, we have a UNODC, United Nations Office for Drugs and Crimes. They have a mm, cooperation with Iran. Tomorrow there will be uh, a, a meeting on that. But many of the donors to this program, they are European countries. Uh, one program in, uh, of uh, one project in the program is. Uh, on law enforcement and border control, where many of those who are arrested in Iran for drug-related uh, charges, uh, uh, you know, they are sentenced to death, several hundreds every year. And the donor countries, I think what they could do, you know, UNODC as an organization and the donor countries, to say that as long as there is capital punishment for uh, drug-related charges, we do not cooperate with you. They don't say it, and I really don't know why, because all the donors are abolitionist countries, and uh, several hundred people are being executed. Uh, and and I, I don't say that UNODC is responsible for that, but they contribute to it, and they also give legitimacy to execution of drug uh, traffickers when you know UN is cooperating with Iran in that fight. Thank you. Last minute. آقای دکتر شهید متشکرم که توجه میکنید به این موضوع اما درست ما همه میدونیم که دولت ایران توجه نمیکنه به تعهدات بین المللی خودش اما آیا جامعه جهانی مسئلهش با دولت ایران مسئله انرژی هستهی هست یا مسئله حقوق بشر و دموکراسی ما مسئله من اگر حقوق بشر و دموکراسی باشه مسئله انرژی هستهی هم منتفی خواهد شد بمب هستهی با حقوق بشر و دموکراسی تحقق حقوق بشر و دموکراسی در ایران منتفی خواهد شد جامعه جهانی مسئلهش مسئله بمب هستهی هست نه مسئله حقوق بشر در ایران در حال حاضر این بسیار خطرناکه اولا سانیان همونطور که محمود اشاره کرد مسئله مواد مخدر و جا... کمک جامعه جهانی بسیار بسیار خطرناکه برای جامعه ایران جا... جامعه جهانی چرا سرس و منبع مواد مخدر در افغانستان را نابود نمی کنه که تمام جوانان ایرانی در معرضش هستند و جامعه جهانی توجه نداره در ماده هشت قانون مبارزه مواد مخدر ایران اومده که اگر کسی مواد مخدر به هر میزانی داشته باشه و قصد خارج کردن از ایران داشته باشه به, به اعدام محکوم نمیشه من کلاینتی داشتم از اندونزی که در فرودگاه دستگیر شده بود با 7 کیلوگرم هروئین اما به حبس عبد محکوم شد و من همین دفاع کردم کلاینتی هم داشتم که بسیار بسیار فقیر بود به نام گوری و فقط برای نگهداری 240 گرم اعدام شد که من صورت این زن را هیچ وقت فراموش نمی کنم کسی را سراغ دارم که فقط برای 46 گرم اعدام شده در حالی که جامعه جهانی داره حمایت می کنه از این موضوع اما برای ترافیک مواد مخدر به بیرون از مرزای ایران مجازات اعدام وجود نداره به راحتی این مسئله حل پس من اعتقاد دارم که جامعه جهانی مسئولیتش را به خوبی اعمال نکرده در مقابل اشتباهات در مقابل قانونگذاری های نادرست و در مقابل رفتار خطرناک دولت ایران Thank you Mr. Raisi Now I want to know how many people from the form want to speak because I have limited time and I must divide it and after the Uh, okay. 
everybody, everyone can speak just three minutes, not four, because we don't have time. Here, no, the first is Lady Miss Lea. Um, any language. Uh, so, Nina Hadi Hastam, Masula Committee, Bina Mali Ali Enam, Va. دو هفته قبل وقتی ما اعلام کردیم علنی که میایم تو این جلسه از طرف میام چه بود؟ مینا هدی هستم از کمیته بین المللی علیه اعدام ما دو هفته قبل اعلام کردیم که میایم تو این جلسه هیئت از طرف کمیته علیه اعدام شرکت میکنیم در طول این دو هفته از چهار زندان از ایران نامه دادند که ما بیاریم تو این کنگره مطرح بکنیم. از زندان تبریز که نامه خطاب به احمد شهید هست و گفتن که خواهان یک کمیسیون حقیقتیاب هستن که بره اونجا اعدام و سنگسار رو رسیدگی بکنه. از غجای شهر، از تهران و از زانیار و لقمان مرادی که عکس شد وقتی به احمد شهید نشون دادن میشنا. و در این حال امروز صبح که تو هواپیما بودم دیدم یه ایمیل اومده نامه سرگشاده به ما به من که به این کنگره میام از طرف زندانیان زندان احباس که خواستن که خواستنشون رو تو این کنگره مطرح بکنیم به نظر من جامعه جهانی میتونه خیلی اعمال فشار کنه روی جمهوری اسلامی و اینجا در مورد کمپین سکینه محمدی آشتیانی حرف زده شد دوستانی که اینجا از ایران هستن منو میشناسن در مورد مبارزه علیه اعدام من سازمان حقوق بشری به اون صورت نیستم ولی من تو گوشام صدای اینا هست همشون خیلی هاشون به من زنگ میزنن با من حرف میزنن محکومین به اعدام با ما تماس میگیرن و من کسی هستم که کمپین سکینه محمدی آشکنی رو در دنیا رهبری کردم مسئول کمیته بینالبرالی علیه سنگسار هستم و به نظر من اون ارگو رو همینطور که دوستانم اینجا گفتم باید به کار برد هیچ دولت اروپایی، هیچ دولتی در دنیا اهمیت نمیده به این همه اعدام هر چهار ساعت یه نفر در ایران اعدام میکنن و اون کسی که تو سلول مرگ نشسته نمیخواد بعد از اعدامش گزارش بدیم میخواد یه کاری بکنیم نجات پیدا کنه و شما که همه فعالین علیه اعدام هستیم به نظر من ما همه با هم باید یک روز در دنیا اعلام کنیم علیه اعدام ها در ایران حکومت ایران یه حکومت فاشیست اسلامیه از روزی که اومده سر کار کشته خانم من وقت شما تموم شد چون واقعا زیاد هم من خواستم بگم که باید این موضوع رو اهمیت داد و بین المللی اقدام کرد مثل جوان مردی نیکس بار من به فارسی حرف میزنم شما هم دو دقیقه یا مثل سه دقیقه دو دقیقه سه دقیقه خیشون یه دقیقه بیشتر صحبت کنم در صحبت هایی که اینجا شد صحبت این بود که اعدام در ایران وسیله برای فشار سیاسی بر مردم این درسته نه تنها این که اعدام در ایران از اعدام هایی در مورد مواد مخدر یا اعدام هایی در مورد مسائل دیگه در خدمت سیاسته بلکه اده زیادی همینطور که دکتر شهید گفت به جرم محاربه به جرم فساد در عرض یا به این انابی اعدام میشن در ایران تعداد اینها از سالی که جمهوری اسلامی پنجه و هفت سر کار اومده مستدام اعدام پیدا کرده این یک نوع جنگ اعلام نشده به مردم ایرانه به مردمیه که به هر حال برای آزادیاشون یا برای به مسائل اتنیکیشون یا برای مسائل مذهبیشون یا برای هر گونه حقوقی پا میشن به اینها رو برای اینکه به سیر فشار بذارن به عناوین مختلف براشون پرونده سازی میکنن در نمونه هایی که آقای رحفت گفتن از مریوان این افراد یکیشون روزنامه نگار بود دیگری فعال حقوق بشری بود فعال محیط زیستی بود این دو نفر هر هیچ کدوم هیچ گونه خطایی که سنگین باشه مرتکب نشده بودن به جز اون که کارهایی بکنن که در این کشورها به یک جایزه داده میشه در این کشورها ازشون قدردانی میشه در ایران برای هر گونه فعالیتی یک وسیله ای هست یک بهانه ای هست برای احکام سنگین احکامی که همین حالا در زندان های زیاد که حد اقل سی نفر در کردستان زیر حکم اعدام هستن به جرائم محاربه در در اهواز حداقل 
20 نفر 25 نفر در زیر اعدام هستن که 5 نفرشون حکمشون تایید شده در بلوچستان حداقل 30 نفر زیر اعدام هستن که حکمشون تایید شده در تهران هستن کسایی که به جرم سیاسی حکمشون تایید شده اما از یک یک نکته دیگر رو من اضافه بکنم خیلی خلاصه آقای جان خلاصه میکنم بیشترین اعدام در ایران اعدام مواد مخدره ولی شما نگاه کنید به تمام آمارهایی که که جمهوری اسلامی اعلام میکنه از ایرنا از فارس نیوز از جای دیگه نگاه کنید ببینید مقداری رو که اینها باش دستگیر میشن چقدر پایینه حتی سی گرم وجود داره هفتاد گرم وجود داره هفت کیلو وجود داره کجاست این پنجاه تن صد تن هزار تن ده هزار تن پنجاه هزار تن و میلیون تن که به اسم اروپا میاد از مسیر ایران یعنی من تایید میکنم حرف جناب حسین اسمتون یاد نمیاد در حال چیزی که اینجا هستن به صحبت کردن از تجارب خودشون در ایران شما پیدا نمی کنید که مثلا کسی که ماده مخدر رو خارج میکنه با 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 وزن سنگینی از ماده مخدر دستگیر و یا اعدام بشه بلکه افراد فقیر و توی دست جامعه هستن که امکان گرفتن وکیل هم ندارن جان وقت با هم آقای اجلس آقای اجلس Thank you very much. I would like just to add an email to your page. We can hear you. We can hear you. Go ahead. No, no. To your very interesting discussion. Um, I represent the Association for Human Rights in Kusan Ali and Ambros in Geneva. We made a research about uh, yes, this health related to other issues or under the, the, the uh, cover. Uh, According to our research, but also according to human rights, uh, human rights committee, human rights committee, most of the people executed under the cover of related to rights issues are members of ethnic uh, uh, nationalities or religious groups in Iran, namely the Baluchi people, the Kurdish people, the Awazi Arab, the Turkmen, or Azeri. This is a fact. And for example, in uh, according to a national. Uh, uh, study about drug uh, users in Iran in 1976 by the regime of Shah. Virtually all the people using drugs or with drugs were uh, either Shiite Muslims or ethnic Turks. But uh, <coughs> the Kurds or the Baluchi or Turkmen are mostly Sunni Muslims. And today in Kurdistan, Iran, we have 80 percent of the prisoner, the people in the prison are related to drug issues. And just for information, tomorrow at uh, half past three, uh, I will talk about this in detail uh, in the round table called drug trafficking and the risk penalty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this gentleman here. Uh, I am uh, Samir Nouri from Iran. I worked a lot with uh, Mina Hadi. Uh, about a lot of cases, about uh, Sakina Ashtiani, about the Nazan Infatik, about the Delarabi, about Luqman and Zania. Uh, Mina, she is a famous person and I worked a lot of over the here. Now uh, I have a question about the, the law and related to the political uh, power and the frame of the ideology. The frame of the ideology of the Republic uh, Islam of Iran is Islam. And the political power is the uh, political movement, Islamic political movement. You can't change the, the law and the political power in power, of our the political movement in power, and have a frame of Islam all the ayats and hadith and all supporting the, the death penalty, and all the cases look to them. It's depending on those law. So I, my question is, how you can change? If this law in in war, okay. it, it's, it's a law. Thank you. Okay. The gentleman, uh, the lady here, second. Does it work? Yeah. Thank you very much. I just have two questions. Uh, first of all, I would like to know what happened to your brothers that raped Leila. Were they not condemned to death penalty for having sexual relations with a family member? And um, my second question would be, how many of these that 
are condemned to death penalty are women, and if there's a difference between the death penalty for women and men, like related to the crimes they commit. Thank, Thank you. you. Gentleman there. Hello, is it on? Yeah. I'd like to thank all the speakers for their valuable presentations. But uh, first, direct my comments to Dr. Ahmad Shahi uh, and his valuable presentation. Uh, the, I'd like to point out that the new Islamic Penal Code that was enacted uh, last month uh, has added one new charge uh, which translates as rebellion, and uh, I think it has been adopted from the Quran. Uh, so it means that they're separating political charges to put them under rebellion, uh, indirectly admitting that they will be executed for political charges. Second, uh, you mentioned that uh, the age of criminal responsibility for girls is nine years and for boys 15 years, I like to clarify that these are lunar years, which means that it is eight something and 14 something, uh, 8.7, 14.6 years of age. Third, apostasy and blasphemy have not been mentioned in the penal law, uh, but uh, we should not forget that <clears throat> there is a charge called uh, what, Sab or Nabi, cursing the Prophet and other grand prophets, and that amounts to blasphemy, I should think. Well, you know better. Third, the charge of apostasy has been mentioned in the press code, but 